And I'm going to start by looking at productivity in Australia. I don't know if anybody read The Economist last month, but there was a table of productivity in the OECD. Australia ranked 16th on that list. In July, Treasury published productivity growth in Australia between 2011 and 2021. It went backwards from 1.8% to 1.2% in a decade where organizations were digitally transforming. Clearly, we've got a lot of work to do in the area of productivity. And I first put question, and it's going to go to you, uh, Francine. What role do you think CFOs should play in driving productivity in their organization? Yeah, it's a great question. I I think um, as CFOs, we have a really unique viewpoint because we sit across the whole organisation and we can really see how all the different parts of the businesses are operating together to achieve the strategic outcomes of the business. So we, we really are both a catalyst and a supporter in that way. I think we can see the areas that can be impacted by productivity improvements, including our own, and we should try and lead by example. Um, but once we start to roll out in the business, it's really our job to support them and make sure they've got the data, as Solly talked about earlier, to see that the productivity improvements are being realised and that we are using those resources in other areas where we can get value. Okay. Jenny, uh, you, you've got sort of macro credentials across the sort of organisation, heavily influenced by macro forces in the work that you do. Is the CFO, how does the CFO lead by that example? I think um, I think we spoke about this uh, when I when I met with you. Um, uh, I'm the CFO of one of the platforms across Australian Unity, and uh, the benefit I bring is having that kind of enterprise view, uh, a little bit like what Francine said. And so I I can see where the various pieces of the puzzle sit. I have a team of about 60 people. At one stage, I had a team of about 100 people, and I can't do what they can do. And one of the, I think, the important role that we play is to convert strategy and vision and activity to kind of really galvanise and energise the team because they're the ones that will deliver the solutions and then have the productivity kind of impact. Um, the challenge we have is that we've just come out of COVID. People are emotionally fatigued, then we're hit with these macroeconomic, whether it's inflation and the mortgages going up. And so, our, you know, the well-being of those individuals that we depend on to try drive productivity and innovation, you know, they've been impacted. And so it's this balancing act of kind of managing that and kind of bringing them along the journey. I think that's what we kind of we kind of talked about. And so as the CFO, you're not just the kind of strategic business partner. You're, all, you're also a people person, right? Yeah. You're leading large teams. Um, and productivity is, is um, particularly with hybrid working as well, um, if, if you work in an environment like we do where it's kind of three days in the office and two days at home, or working from home, well, those two days, it's five paces from the bedroom to the office. How do you get someone motivated and productive in 10 paces. So it's... It, it, I want to come to upskilling a bit later on, but I do want to focus on the role of the CFO as being the catalyst. And Greg, can we really be the poster child for the rest of the business of automation? I mean, I personally know how laborious the amount <laughs> of back office financial reporting work that goes on to produce reports every month. How can we tell others if we're not walking the talk ourselves? I think the, the nature of the work that we do makes us prime candidates to actually implement automation. You know, we've got um, some of the most structured processes um, and repeatable tasks within, a, within an organization. So by uh, I guess identifying that and implementing automa automation in our own space, also taking into consideration the amount of controls and governance that is necessary across finance processes. If it can be achieved within finance, then it's a perfect example for the rest of the organisation. I mean, so many people present business cases to the CFO. This time you've got to present a business case to the rest of the organisation. Isn't the reality that the pain you experience not really experienced by others? 
Um, I think you need to mix up the type of automation that you bring in. I, by undertaking automation within finance, I, I think the good thing about finance is that it touches the whole organization. There's not many, pro, there's not many um, business units within my organization that don't have an interaction with finance. So if you're able to incorporate that automation to benefit, I guess, the ordinary employees within the organization in those business lines, that's gonna, um, they will see the benefit I guess observe it within finance because it's impacting them directly. Um, but you also have to mix up where you identify and implement automation as well. So you need to actually deliver automation and improvements and efficiencies within the business as well. And I think the view that we have in finance and um, you know, the exposure across all functions, but also all business lines enable, enables us to identify where that may be effective and, and drive it. Barbara, there are going to be people in the audience here who work for multinational organizations where sometimes the head office tells everyone what to do. How do you make an impact in such an environment? I suppose um, it, is, well, it is quite tough and, and we certainly experience it. And, you know, uh, what we found was when we uh, rolled out um, our ERP, uh, we were kind of forced on a path where we had to follow what was originally done in in America, and um, but some of the uh, modules didn't quite work for us the way we expected it to. So one of them was the um, collections AR, um, and we weren't. What we originally wanted to do was to um, hook on a the module that we were currently using, and we were told categorically, no way. It has to be standardized, et cetera. So we actually went to our bank and we, we, we spoke with them and we asked whether or not there was an opportunity for us to use um, something uh, you know, th th that they had, which was REC, which is um, intelligent receivables. Uh, it wasn't used anywhere else. Uh, America and, uh, and Australia and New Zealand were the first to, uh, well, America was the first to roll out the ERP. We were the second before EMEA. Um, and we basically put up a business case as to what the benefits would be. And really, the, it was a bit of a risk for us um, because it had to be integrated to our system, but the alternative was throwing people at, at the problem, which really wasn't an option either. Um, so we managed to, to persuade the uh, global CFO of us to move uh, forwards with it. And interestingly enough, now that EMEA have rolled out um, the ERP, they're using it and now America are wanting to use it as yeah. well. So we were actually a, a good test case, and that's how we try to sell it to them, is saying, well, you know, we, we can be a test case, we can see if it works, if it works somewhere else, we can roll it out. Yeah. So I think, I think you need to stand by um, your guns on something, some things you have to give in, and you just have to accept you, you're part of a global um, organization, and leverage what they've got. So we certainly go and we leverage what bots and what um, uh, AI is being used already. But the, if there are opportunities um, for you to pursue things locally, I think it's important for you to do that. And that's exactly what we did. Okay. Francine, one of the things that Solly was talking about there was the need for value. And, and I'm curious, what do you see the value that finance generates for an organization? Oh, what a question for a room um, full of CFOs. <laughs> um, I think, the old notion of a bean counter or a number cruncher is just not enough anymore. Um, finance is such an all-encompassing function that really sits at the strategic level across the whole organisation. So the value that we bring now is really pulling everything together and making sure it aligns with the strategic objectives of what we're trying to achieve. So this is where automation is amazing because we can take some of the repetitive tasks away and free up the time to do the functions that actually become more value adding across the organization from finance. Okay. You were telling, talking to me, Jenny, about, about the importance of having two different perspectives on it, the short term, immediate perspective and the longer term. Sometimes a lot of people can get embroiled in the transactional stuff. How do you find time to think more strategically? I think it's, I need to, and I, I try to role model stepping away from the business. And that might be, you know, everyone's got a different way of doing things, but that might be, you know, taking time and going for a run or, 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 or doing something like that or participating in, 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 in a um, conference like this. 
I try and pull out my team in the same way. Um, I think it's through automation of, and, and we've, we've had running some pilots throughout the organisation and particularly in finance to free teams up, allocating them kind of projects that they can kind of get excited about, aligning their performance and, and their kind of bonuses to the achievement of those projects, creating kind of collaborative teams. So we're constantly thinking of different ways to get people motivated and energised and off the tools and um, into environments where they can cope co-create co and showcasing when one person, if you've got a team of 60 and one, one person or one team does something great through kind of a technology project or something like that, getting them to showcase it, getting them to talk to their, you know, up in a forum with executives and with their colleagues. And so it's kind of trying to create this momentum and energy that becomes hopefully ful fulfilling over, over time. And yet, um, Greg, we're talking about a transformation journey here, and in many ways, it can be quite threatening for people. I mean, you talk AI, and we'll come to that in a moment on the panel, mm -hmm. but I'm wondering how you bring team members on a journey of change in an organization where in some ways you're questioning the value of the work they do. Uh, that could be a basic assessment, right? but... Um... What we've done for the last couple of years is set the expectation of where we want finance to be. So we actually want finance to um, be supporting the business to, be, to maximise its own performance. So how do you do that? You actually need to partner closer with the business. Uh, to enable you to do that, you need capacity. So if they can appreciate that that's a, that's a space they'd like to work in, then they're going to buy more into automation and you know, elimination of some of their traditional tasks because they have visibility of, well, this is, this is what's coming as a result of that. They have to go on a journey and, um, you know, through, you know, implementation of, you know, small step projects, they can see how they can spend time helping the business more strategically. But um, yeah, that's, it was giving them an understanding of how their role will change for the better prior to entering into it. And yet when we spoke beforehand, Greg, you were talking about the importance of broadening their perspective before they, you took them on that journey so, so they could see where you wanted them to go to. Could you share your thinking in that area? Uh, yeah, so by that, um, you know, we, had, we do have a couple of resources centrally that due to turnover, we were able to have the skill set in data, BI, um, and some other people from other organisations who've done some of this automation and changes in the past. So we're able to identify some easy wins to actually show by example um, to the broader finance team um, what actually happens or you know, the capacity that can be created from those type of projects. Um, they then, uh, I guess, understand more how they fit into that process and how they can help drive those projects themselves. Okay. Barbara, what skill sets do you want in your modern finance department? I think one of the most in, important skill sets is um, having uh, critical um, thinking skills um, and being inquisitive and always having that mindset of wanting to do better, to change things, uh, to grow um, and to be part of the business and to, to see the value that they can add and not to be the people that sit behind the desk um, and think that they can actually do a finance role behind the desk. So um, uh, uh, at times it's a challenge to change uh, people's mindsets because I think people find it easier just to do, you know, the um, the day-to-day -day finance um, and it's really getting them to, to want to change and to want to grow. Mm. So, so it, it, you, you're actually showing them that actually the existing status quo isn't actually going to help them sustain a career in finance. Absolutely not. You know, gone are the days where finance is about debits and credits and stewardship. Hmm. You know, today it's about business partnering. It's, a, it, it's about partnering. You know, I see my role as, uh, as a CFO, as um, uh, working very closely with the CEO and the leadership team to develop the strategy and implement the strategy, and my finance team is extension of that. And uh, and you know they need to actually spend time within the business understanding, uh, you know um, what 
the opportunities are, what the risks are, and along with the knowledge um, of the numbers, actually provide the insights and the, the value add and be storytellers, you know, and being able to ask, uh, to e explain the why and the what, but also uh, show the what now um, and the implications of what, they, what they're basically doing. And that, that to me is what finance is. You know, um, I also um, have, uh, you know, led quite a few transformations and it's not just uh, finance transformation, the one was the ERP, but in one of my roles, um, I led the transformation of us buying back franchisees. And it was one of the most amazing experiences I had. I've also stuck my hand up uh, within Avis Budget Group to locally lead the ESG strategy and roadmap. You know, that's not necessarily something that a finance person does. Yes, we get involved in the governance side, you know, but to me, um, you know, to, to what Fr uh, Francine said is, is that it's very much, we, we're in that perfect position to be able to see what's actually going um, on within the business and identify the opportunities and the risks and help the business uh, navigate through any challenges or, 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 or drive growth. Yeah, well, Francine, Barbara's sort of pointing a word, mm. a more assertive finance Sorry. team, you know, so, <laughs> yes. uh, so, so she's sort of saying that, you know, the days are, we've got to actually volunteer to do activities that may be broader than our traditional finance role. How easy are you finding it to get the talent you need in your finance department? I think um, recruiting talent has been challenging for the last couple of years across all areas of the business. I think finance is not alone in that. And we've certainly experienced um, real competition trying to get the right talent in the door. Um, the important thing when we're looking for the right talent and what I've found works the best is to be really clear about, um, as Greg mentioned earlier, what are you trying to achieve with your finance department? And what is this person's role in that when they're going to come in? I think you have to really paint the picture for them so that they're aligned with what you're trying to do. It's not enough now to just check that they can run a PL and do some reconciliations. And that's not satisfying work for them. So you, we're not going to be able to retain them and grow them into their roles in that way. Um, so what we're finding is working the best is, as Barbara said, it's really immersing them in the business and making them SMEs in so many different mm -hmm. things beyond finance. And finance is the result of their work, not the reason for it, really. And Jenny, when people come into your organisation, what are they expecting to find in a finance department to stay? I mean, you can make someone join, but what keeps them? Um, I, I look for a, few, a couple of things. Um, and what the commitment I make is that, um, firstly, uh, they need to be up for a transformation journey. They're not walking into a BAU. It's going to face into some challenges. I also commit to sponsoring them in their career and providing them a pathway to other roles within the organisation. Um, I also um, kind of make sure that they, they really understand what they're coming into, who their colleagues are, what the and the strategy for me um, is the organisation strategy, as Francine said, and then finance kind of just informs or enables that wherever possible uh, they're getting, you know, exposure at any forum I can get them into so that, you know, I'm not taking credit for the work that they do mm. and they can see that, you know, their career is going to be better. Often I will hire, I'll recruit individuals without the sector experience so that, you know, that's another thing that that's adding to their to their CV. Okay. And and hopefully through innovation and that they're looking at our our challenges and problems from a tech or from a um, AI or from whatever from a from an, another industry's perspective. Greg, are you finding the sort of new hires are a different breed from where you had before? Are you are they coming in with sort of expectations on the sort of equipment, working from home, you know that sort of type of stuff? Uh, are, are they prima donnas in some way, or technology <laughs> prima donnas? They definitely approach their work early in their career a lot differently to me, Peter. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, yeah, I th yeah, I think there's definitely an expectation of continual growth in knowledge and skills. Um, but I, I don't think I, I definitely don't discount my existing staff. You know, I have some people who have been in their roles for ten years, um, but fortunately, some of them have shown. 
um, you know, they are inquisitive, they are, you know, constantly trying to add value. So when getting them exposed to the tools that are available and examples of where we can drive automation and efficiency has actually motivated them to, to push on to different heights as well. And you were talking to me before about actually that they're not all uh, one breed of person in the finance. There are certain yeah. skills you need to, for some things and others yes. for others. Can you explain that thing? Yeah, sure. So I'm part of a global organization and as part of our finance transformation, they identified functional groups within finance. So there's controllers who are more the gatekeepers and well, everyone here knows what a controller is, but more about ensuring what is in our ledger is accurate and complies with policy. Um, we then have FP&A, which is more reporting, looking for insights, tax, and FinOps, which is more of your non-value-add repetitive tasks. So we went through that transformation. People already know which function or which part of finance they sit and then the expectations that come with that. So um, what we're doing is to, um, looking to drive efficiencies within finance as well as outside of finance, but within finance so that they can um, I guess, grow and take on more complex matters, get involved with, you know, investment business cases, that type of thing. Working closely with the business typically uh, is something a finance uh, employee enjoys doing more of. Baru, we have to get round to the topic of AI because it is the 2023 topic of discussion. You saw when Solly asked who here is doing proof of concepts around uh, AI, almost every hand in the room went up. Where do you see a role for AI as augmenting what IT does? Oh, sorry, what finance does? I think it's about, um, uh, <coughs> I suppose, reducing some of the manual tasks. Um, and, um, and, and around doing um, more of the streamlining processes and, and things like that, um, at least as in initially. Um, I think it's really, really early days uh, with respect to, um, you know, what AI can actually bring to, um, to a business. And I think uh, for, for me, um, working in a global organization, we are somewhat, um, you know, uh, reliant on what the rest of the business is actually doing. But I definitely think that it, it, it can help free up people's times and make people far more efficient, be it within finance, be it within, uh, you know, other shared services type of, of, of roles, you know, like for our database in, in you know, uploading new rate plans and, and things like that, or, or within the call center. So I think, a, a, a lot of it, I think it is very early days. Um, I think uh, businesses can make a mistake to think that they can do everything and AI can do everything. Mm. Um, because I think, but from a finance perspective, you're not going to be able to take away, it's, it's, it's about more that manual repetitive because that value add of business partnering, AI can't do. Okay. What uh, Barbara's talking about there, Francine, is giving capacity, extra capacity in, in the IT, oh, sorry, the, sorry, I'm in finance, in the finance department. Where do you see that capacity is best invested? I think as we've talked about and, and where I'm seeing a lot of success across my own team is freeing them up from some of those tasks so they can immerse themselves more in the business and really take on that business partnering role. Um, the result of that, is tangible. We've seen, you know, much better resource allocation decisions being made because we've got more in-depth data, um, because the finance team really understand what the business is trying to achieve, as opposed to finance just pushing out saying, here's the number you can use, go and see what you can do. I'm finding a lot of it's coming back the other way, just because of the relationships they're building across the business. Jenny, where do you think the guardrails? I mean, you heard Solly talk about let's be uh, sort of tentative with AI, don't let's bet the farm on it. We need to establish guardrails around it. What do you see as the guardrails? Um, I'll be honest, I'm not clear in my mind on the guardrails. What, I, what I, we're experiencing is a bit of kind of ad hoc activity within finance, um, the work that's being done there is incremental and I don't think the business really appreciate what that's meant. Kind of it's reduced the month's end, it may have improved the, you know, removed working weekends or or reduced the, you know, the, the long working hours at month's end, but it hasn't really created value. Where I see value and potentially guardrails 
is around predictive AI, yeah. particularly when um, the heavy lifting, for example, in our environment around plan, strategic planning and forecasting and um, you know, providing an outlook and managing you know, for various kind of capital, because we're a very complex organisation, it's still largely manual. The strap planning process takes us and brings the organisation to a standing halt for three months. Like, it's crazy. We've got 12 businesses, so that's understandable to some extent. But I, I'm not yet... The guardrails that I, I'm concerned for is, for example, if it is used uh, around health, in, in the health space, in the human services space, to help you kind of respond to an allied health question or, a, or a, you know, in providing care services or responding to a, because we're, we're in kind of that space, responding to a, a customer who's vulnerable. If you use, that might be guardrails to privacy. So using data, um, uh, personal data in a way that you're not supposed to, so they, they may be guardrails. Um, so yeah, I'm still, Warming one. Mm. I probably was yeah. clearer when I spoke to you. Yeah, no, 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 no. Greg, Greg had some. I'll bring in Greg because I think Greg, you, you had some thoughts on yeah. on guardrails for AI. For sure. Um, I, being in finance, I like everything to have an audit trail. So the, you know, the, the maybe it's the predictive example um, where you could say, okay, well, based on you know, what we're seeing from an economic outlook or, you know, things, key indicators we're expecting to happen in the market, where do we expect certain business lines to be, you know, performing in future years? I, I think, I guess my understanding of AI is, d depending on the complexity of it, there is no clear structure as to where it's coming from those conclusions. Um, there were risks, uh, examples provided this morning around, it's gonna, it's going to learn from data it's provided, and if the data that it's provided is biased or yeah. mm. you know has yeah. some kind of issues with it, that's going to flow through to mm. the result. But you did imply to me that you actually got to say AI has produced that, and this is what it based its. This yeah, is the that's, data that's, it based its position. That's the audit on. trail. Yeah. So yeah. it would be yeah. If to get to a position where it's saying, well, this is the expected output, and this is the basis for that output, then you have something you can assess critically evaluate as the subject matter expert to gain comfort with it, and then maybe tweak components of it to make it more accurate. Go on. Just on that, um, when uh, before COVID, we were looking at um, implementing workforce management system within our operations. Um, and then through COVID, uh, we thought, oh, you know, it would be great because people aren't working. You know, in hire car, we lost 85% of our business overnight, you know, and we were still, um, keeping people on because of um, you know JobKeeper and and the likes and um, we thought oh fantastic we can do it but the challenge was that um, it needed machine learning it, it needed data to do the machine learning but we didn't have anything that made sense mm -hmm. so we actually had to stop and it's only now that we've had a year or so of semi-normal that we can actually even think about putting it in um, so that it will make sense. You know, so I think uh, your point is is very very valid um, around. Uh, you still need the people to assess whether or not uh, the information that's coming out of the system around um, forecasting, um, because we uh, use a forecasting module mod uh, module actually makes sense. My we've started using it, um, uh, but my team are continually having to um, upload data because. The segmentation isn't right. The rates aren't right, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So we're not actually getting the right information. So you need to be very, um, uh, you still need to be analytical around what information is actually coming out. Yeah, you've got to finesse it in yeah. some ways. Okay, I got, we're coming to, I see the drinks appearing. So I've got a final question for, <laughs> for everyone. I'm gonna to go to you, Francine. Where do you see the role for CFOs in taking risks in, in an organization? I think it's important that we lead by example, uh, as I think we've talked about before. So it, like any organisation, we really need to make sure we have the right risk frameworks in place um, so that we can go and trial some of these things and see if we can get the productivity gains we're hoping for. And I think the best place to start is to get a few quick wins under the belt. Like you talked about, Barbara, you know, doing things in smaller segments first and seeing if they're successful before rolling them out. 
Um, if we have no appetite for risk, we're never going to change. And we know that's just not, it's not possible and it's not where we need to be in the organisation. How do you discuss, where do you take risks, uh, Jenny? So um, we obviously have a very uh, mature risk appetite and risk uh, statement and risk framework and those sorts of things. And uh, we're a bit dyslexic in that way. So we, we're happy to take risk, but if the risk comes home, we're not happy with that result. <laughs> and so pricing it and having kind of checkpoints and reminding people of, of what they've kind of um, done and, and being a, taking a, a portfolio view on things. So if you're taking a risk here, you're not taking it there. If you've got an enterprise view and you understand, you know, we're going to raise capital, you know, you kind of got to keep all of that in, in kind of in your consideration and constantly reminding people of, of the decision they make to take a particular risk and how you're kind of, um, you know, check the checkpoints you have along the way. So, for example, we've got a home health business. If that's underperforming, then I've got to pull forward revenue or realise one-offs or manage that to kind of um, buffer that risk. If I'm the business that's undergoing, you know, ma macroeconomic kind of risk and my earnings are under pressure, well, then I can't afford to take any more risk. Yeah. And I may have to pause some stuff and let other people kind of do that. So... It's that enterprise view and, or portfolio view, if that's the way you, you think about it. Mm. Greg, property lasts a long time. So how do you, you know, you can make a risk, uh, risky decision today and you may live with it for a long time afterwards. How, does the, how do you make uh, yeah. uh, measured risk decisions? It's the appropriate business case to begin with, but also the governance following it being implemented. Like typically if I'm implementing something new, I'll do it via a pilot. I wouldn't go straight robo-debt day one. It yeah. would be um, something smaller to prove, um, I guess to test your governance over the process and that it's having the impact you expect. Um, so yeah, picking a, um, you know, an environment or a sample which will ma make that more broader application more comfortable. Okay. Barbara, uh, the last uh, question to you on this area of risk. Uh, I look at uh, the car hire business. I look at the impact Uber's had. I look at GoGet going around uh, the cities. I'm sure you are conscious that your business model could be disrupted or is being disrupted. How do you encourage uh, more of a risk-taking uh, attitude amongst your executives? <laughs> With a lot of difficulty. Um, <laughs> I, I suppose, I mean, one of the things that, um, that we have focused on as a business is, is on what our strategy is, um, as opposed to necessarily, and, and, and um, getting too concerned about what is going on outside. And it doesn't mean that we're going to be the next Nokia or anything like that, because obviously you've got to be uh, conscious of, of, of what's happening outside. Um, but it's about being measured about uh, how you approach th things and make sure that when you do take a risk, it's around, you know, it, it's still aligned to what your st ultimate strategy is, that you understand what the financial implications are and operationally you can actually deliver on it. So, you know, we do try and keep to our core strategy, but are very, very conscious about what our competitors are doing because it's not just about being disrupted, it's also about you know, um, the approach of, of, of what, our, um, what our competitors are doing as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that, that, that's, uh, that's really what we, we, we try and do. 